swastika of the Nazi party. It is gone today, blasted from the earth, but the memory of its evil genius remains. Great is man's devastation of his own handiwork. Some men's thirst for conquest is unquenchable. Names like Genghis Khan and Attila the Hun freeze the blood of men and strike terror into their hearts. Such a name was Adolf Hitler. What kind of man was this strutting, shouting fanatic of the Third Reich? If anyone really knew Adolf Hitler, surely it was his own family. Here is Adolf Hitler's sister today. Her name is Paula Wolf. Let her speak. I quote her. When we children played together, my brother Adolf was always the leader. All the others did what he told them to do. They must have had an instinct that his will was stronger than theirs. Father wanted Adolf to become a government official as he was himself. But my brother could not make up his mind. He wasn't the type to sit all the time. And therefore, as a government official, he would not feel at home. Hitler, a faceless nobody, a failure in early life who rose from the depths of a defeated and despairing Germany after World War I and fell at Armageddon years later amid the terrible wreckage of his own creation, the Third Reich. To historians, Hitler's success with the German masses stemmed from his gift of oratory, from his speeches, which had something of Wagnerian music, a foggy conglomeration of gods and heroes and blood and race. The tale of his boyhood in Kaiser Wilhelm's Germany is soon told. In the city streets, among the crowd, the camera's eye seeks in vain for the son of a petty customs official. Proud, apart, almost friendless, he dreams of being a poet, an architect, an artist. But he winds up as a house painter and sometime common laborer. Through his twenties, the world knew nothing of him. Nineteen fourteen. The Great War rescues him from failure, a time for heroic deeds. A new symbol, the swastika, rises from black German defeat. Members sign up for the German Workers' Party. The symbol appeals to Adolf Hitler. As a corporal, he had been wounded and gassed in the war, and he soon leads the bitter veterans in the dark days that follow. The parades are an integral part of this new political force, soon to become the Nationalist Socialist or Nazi Party. It is now 1920, and Hitler talks himself into the leadership of the party. Nineteen twenty-three, Hitler and General Ludendorff lead the abortive beer hall riots in Munich. Hitler goes to prison, and the fanatic Dr. Goebbels takes over the party. From headquarters in Munich, Goebbels screams, we build the Third Reich on propaganda. While the parades go on, Hitler sits in Landsberg prison and writes, Mein Kampf, the Bible of the Nazi movement, the answer to unemployment, bread lines, depression, fight, fight. Julius Schaub, an early follower of Hitler and a fellow prisoner during Germany's days of desperation, talks now. We have our gemeinsamen Festungszeit in Land. I quote, while we were prisoners together at Landsberg, Adolf Hitler spent the mornings working on his book, Mein Kampf. In the evening after supper, when we came together, he used to read us several chapters from his book. There were discussions. The main participants in these discussions were Hess, Griebel, and Dr. Weber. For us young people, it was a training school, if I may say so. Because at that time, we hadn't realized just what Adolf Hitler was planning to do. Out of prison and now a hero, a happy Hitler resumes control of the party. The fascist salute borrowed from Mussolini becomes part of the ritual, along with the banners and the rallies. Other close ties with the Italian fascists are built. Hitler and Rudolf Hess greet Mussolini in Munich, perhaps seeking to learn the way to seize power. 
The anti-Semite fanatic Julius Stryker is there, and the groundwork is laid for cooperation between the fascists and the Nazis before Mussolini returned to Rome. Behind the pattern of demonstrations, parades, inflammatory speeches and rituals lies a diabolical purpose. Hitler says in Mein Kampf, man is a fighting animal. A nation, being a community of fighters, is a fighting unit. Any living organism which ceases to fight is doomed to destruction. The present government is weak. Therefore, true Germans must fight this government, conceived in shame and perpetuated in weakness. In speech after speech, Hitler screams his dogma at the German people. Nazi meetings begin to look more like military maneuvers than political rallies. 1928, Hitler has 12 seats on the German Reichstag. By 1930, the World Depression is strangling Germany. Hitler now has an ally. Rioting and disorders play into the hands of the Nazis. And by 1932, they hold 230 seats. Violence and intimidation become part of the pattern. Their newspapers, filled with inflammatory propaganda, carry the message. 1932, Hindenburg defeats Hitler for the presidency by a slim margin, the beginning of the end for him. January 30th, 1933, Hindenburg is through. Hitler is named Chancellor, and in a torchlight parade, his followers pay pagan homage to the undisputed master of Germany. The Stahlhelm wore steel hats, the SS elite guards and the SA stormtroopers are all there, and they will spread terror throughout the land. Hitler now has the support of the big German cartels. Hitler is now able to put into practice his thesis, as spelled out in Mein Kampf, that the aim of all education and all effort is to produce a German who can become a soldier. The Nazi party can now start organized persecution of those Hitler has declared enemies of the state. Attention, Jews, the sign reads. The Nazi party's chosen goons will carry out their orders with a will. They swoop down on their victims. Homes are broken into day and night. Hitler says in Mein Kampf, only the application of brute force used continuously and ruthlessly can bring about a decision in favor of the side it supports. Early in 1933, all meetings of the Communist Party are forbidden in Germany. After the Reichstag fire, 4,000 are arrested and hurled into concentration camps behind barbed wire fences. Brown shirts and black shirts join in these roundups. Up to the time of Hitler's appointment as Chancellor, control of the Prussian police has rested in the hands of the President. Now that is ended. The Prussian police are commanded by Hermann Goering, whose beer barrel shape contrasts with the lean, hard bodies of the men under his command. not to reason why or to question the will of the Fuhrer. August 2nd, 1934, President von Hindenburg, the idol of the German people, dies. Hitler digs in, assuming the presidency and consolidating the office with that of Chancellor. He prods the German people toward his goal at an ever-quickening pace. The Nazi party consolidates its strength and follows its blueprint to dominate the entire country. Hitler begins to acquire the glassy stare of the self-convinced messiah and has already become a total dictator. Several months earlier, he told a dismayed Reichstag the details of his first bloodbath. Minister President Hermann Goering, Hitler says, has been the avenging angel of the Führer. Kurt von Schleicher and his wife have been shot dead. Captain Ernest Röhm, once Hitler's companion, is gone. Cries out Hitler, if anyone reproaches me and asks why I did not resort to the regular courts of justice, then I say this. In this hour, I was responsible for the fate of the German people. (laughs) 
A large standing army is forbidden by the Versailles Treaty. But for a long time, the Nazis have managed to circumvent this. Since 1925, they've had an organization known as the Reichswehr under Baldur von Schirach, the youth organizer. There is a cadet corps and a phony labor corps. Every village, every town, every city adds to the roster of young men trained to serve as soldiers of the Reich. These labor battalions are pledged to serve Hitler in these words. Never in the trenches, never surrounded by bursting bombs, but we are soldiers of the Reich. At first, these men drill with shovels, and Germany has more hunting clubs than game, a cover for other military organizations. Gradually, the world begins to see through this massive subterfuge. in review before the Reichswehr. Panzer cars begin to appear. As time passes, the goal, world conquest, seems closer. Hitler begins to feel that he is as ready as he ever will be. March 7th, 1936, he announces his troops will reoccupy the demilitarized Rhineland. The troops march west, 35,000 strong. Don't worry, Hitler tells the Allies, this is only symbolic. Nevertheless, world capitals are jittery. Paris considers mobilization, but nothing happens. Britain is too preoccupied with her economic problems. Hitler's bold revival of German militarism, the reappearance of the German eagle, the dedication of the Nazi party, all these signs fail to arouse action. America, with prosperity returned, is indifferent. By 1938, Hitler has an air force of 1,500 first-class fighters, tanks and panzer cars for his slick motorized division, and three and a half million trained soldiers. March 11, 1938, the Führer makes his first move across traditional German borders. He invades Austria, and within two days, a puppet Austrian chancellor proclaims the unification of the two countries. Another diplomatic card in Hitler's hand, the revived German Navy, a nightmare to Britain with her exposed sea lanes. She, France, and Italy sign the infamous Munich Pact. September 1938. By the following March, Hitler gobbles up the remainder of a prostrate Czechoslovakia. The great Skoda munitions works is added to the Nazi arsenal. More weapons for de Führer's conquests. The Munich Pact becomes a symbol of appeasement, and the world wonders where the next strike will be. And now, Russia begins to show an active concern. No bridegroom could be happier than Adolf Hitler, who is keeping his rendezvous with destiny. In six short years since he became chancellor, the German eagle again has the world trembling. Facing France, the Siegfried defense line bristles with tank traps and guns. But Hitler's move will not be there, but to the east. Yes, Poland is the next target. As Germany and Italy sign a military pact, the German divisions are sent to the Polish border and begin maneuvers. The world 
note, hoping for Russian intervention, is shocked when Hitler and Stalin sign a friendship pact. It is not long before the maneuvers are recognized by the world for what they are, preparation for another Hitler invasion. To the Polish border, Hitler has sent divisions of cavalry to cope with the Polish mud when it becomes too difficult for the mechanized divisions. Everything goes according to plan. Out of the youth groups have come divisions of hardened soldiers ready to die for the fatherland. Out of the young groups of athletes who practice jumping come the tough paratroopers ready to strike with lightning speed. From the glider clubs, supposedly sports clubs, come the trained pilots to man the Messerschmitt. And out of the merchant marine come the trained submarine crews, ready to man the Atlantic wolf packs with which the world is ill-prepared to deal. Yes, the youth groups are serving their purpose in the Nazi master plan. September 1st, 1939. Germany's radio stations crackle out the warnings, stand by, something big. Inside one heavily guarded studio, the Minister of Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels, speaks. The news is world-shaking. Germany has invaded Poland. Within two days, France and Britain have in turn declared war upon Germany. From the balcony of the Reich Chancellery, Adolf Hitler speaks to the people, let us do duty. He is shocked and furious at the allies who come to the aid of Poland. There is fighting in the streets of Danzig, desperate fighting all over Poland. Poland has literally burned off the maps of the world as the Panzer divisions execute the first of the ferocious Blitzkrieg. The German-Polish frontier disappears as the Poles try to oppose a moving 20-mile wall of steel and firepower with their ancient cavalry. Hitler goes to the front to view the slaughter at Poznan. In three weeks, the nation is reduced to unresisting ashes. France had decided to come to the aid of the stricken country, but there is little they can do. Before the autumn leaves have fallen, the subjugation of Poland is complete. The world now knows it is engaged in a death struggle with the former unemployed house painter, now become world conqueror. The screeching fanatic is familiar. But what about the man? In Bavaria, at Berchtesgaden, the man Hitler has built himself a hideout. It has a patio overlooking the wild mountain known as Untersberg. It is here that he entertains top Nazi officials in private. And it is here that his love for a woman grows and becomes a strange part of this implacable despot's private life. Eva Braun, ex-receptionist in the Photoshop run by Hitler's photographer Heinrich Hoffmann, had begun to appear earlier at Hitler's private receptions at his mountain retreat. Few people knew the strange fascination he has for women. Because of him, three had tried suicide. Eva Braun walked into Hitler's life in the early 30s, but only his intimate friends know of the relationship. While he conferred with party aides, Eva was always in the background at Hitler's retreat, the Berghof. As a very young girl, she had been a, in a woman's institute in Braunau. Hitler took her under his protection in 1932, after she'd tried to kill herself. With Eva came her sister, Gretel. In this beautiful setting, the Polish massacre and the coming war with the Allies seemed remote indeed. A cocktail party atmosphere prevails a great deal of the time. Minor party officials whose names are lost to history are there chatting with the Führer as Eva and her sister and friends provide almost comic relief. 
And looking at her, one might be inclined almost to pity her. Poor girl, scarcely more than a child, and flattered by the attention of a ruler of her country, she can hardly be expected to act differently. She came from the same humble background as Hitler himself, a possible explanation of his preference for her. The wife of the Führer's adjutant, Frau Schaub, sheds a new light on the love life of Germany's master. There was, after all, Hitler the ladies' man. Das Gerücht, dass Adolf Hitler Frauen gegenüber. She says, those rumors that Adolf Hitler was supposed to be abnormal over women are false. As the wife of a man who was his adjutant for 20 years, I had numerous occasions to watch him in private, and also when in the company of ladies. I can assure you that he was definitely a very normal man. He loved women and loved to be in the presence of feminine beauty. I know all about the relationship between him and Eva Braun from 1931 right up to the end. And I also know about many other love affairs. Eva first was seen with Hitler in his house in Munich, and then at the Berchtesgaden hideout when that was built. She is seldom photographed with Hitler. She is rarely alone at the Berghof. In addition to Sister Gretel, she has many of her friends who help to provide light-hearted diversion, as a balance perhaps for the more serious matters under consideration. They are joined by the wives of Hitler's visitors among the party members. Eva herself enjoys the picture-taking sequences, Perhaps it is the camera that causes the playful mood. Perhaps it is an escape from the frightening decisions being made at these meetings. From top to toe, Eva makes an attractive picture of medium height, blue eyes, round face, framed in darkish blonde hair. No comment from Hitler about his sweetheart. From others come varying opinions. Says Heinrich Hoffmann, who discovered her. She is an ordinary, pretty little shop girl with all the frivolity and vanity of her kind. To Dr. Goebbels, she is that stupid flapper. Knowing how Hitler despises fatness in any form, Eva spends a few hours a day in exercise. <laughs> Of course, Hitler, whose waking hours are taken up with a thousand duties and obligations, is hardly able to pay her the attention a girl of her years would normally expect. While some of the entries in her diary tell of Hitler's anger and of his neglect and her own mortal unhappiness, she also writes with pride that she is the mistress of Germany's and the world's greatest man. Then she seems not to mind the neglect. In the Berghof, the housekeeper has long been Frau Raubel, who is Hitler's half-sister. It is her job to keep the establishment going, so that de Fira may always use it as a spot for quiet business matters away from the chancellery. But after her daughter has shot herself for love of Hitler, she resents Eva's installation as her daughter's successor. In the end, Frau Raubel quits her post, leaving Eva the chattel lane responsible only to her lord and master in every sense of the word. Over the years, Hitler's bodyguard, the brutal Martin Bormann, turns the Berghof into a second chancellery, which is always awaiting guests. It has seen such notable personalities as Mussolini, Count Ciano, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor, others too numerous to mention. This is a reception on the lighter side, however. The chief figure in this group is Herr Professor Goebbels, a frequent visitor to the Virgo. Adolf and Eva pose together for home movies. Then Goebbels and Eva's younger sister, Gretel. Gretel is a more fastidious girl than Eva. 
In time, she will marry Hitler's aide de camp, Hermann Fegelein, and suffer tragedy when he is shot by Bormann as a traitor to Hitler. Hitler's most intimate advisors say they don't know at what point the frivolous Eva becomes his mistress. As the wildfire of the war spreads, Hitler more frequently seeks the companionship of Eva. There has been gossip about Hitler and Eva being the parents of a child, but it seems untrue. This baby is probably the daughter of one of her girlfriends. Here is Defer in a happy mood. It is hard to imagine now that a great war is raging. Hitler's private guard is ready for a visitor. The only intimation of war comes when someone like Count Ciano, Mussolini's son-in-law, comes to Bastard Garden. Hitler wants to know when Benito is going to keep his promise to come into the war. Several months have gone by and Italy is still neutral. But this serious business does not interfere with the round of gay swimming parties featuring Eva Braun and her friends in a kind of water ballet. The fact that Britain and France are going to make a real effort to cut short the mad career of her lover does not curtail the daily diving practice. The picnic lunches featuring Das Gut Lager Beer. Another episode starring Eva with a supporting cast of Nazi leaders visiting Berchtesgarten. Perhaps the habit of stripping the possessions from enemies of the Reich has caused them to forget their manners. The girls at the Berghof are always willing to provide amusement. These lakeside frolics are some relief from the other business of the Berghof, the planning of world conquest. era of the rubber raft in the Bavarian lakes near the Burgo, and fun for the visiting leaders of the self-styled master race. Far different from the rubber rafts which are floating in the vast areas of the Atlantic with their human cargoes consigned to the sea by Hitler's roving deadly submarine wolf packs. A graphic report for De Führer, enemy dead, and the plans for further conquest. It is now spring again, April 9th in 1940, and the Nazi planes are in another sky. After a brief show of air might and the march of a few divisions, Denmark and Norway fall before the German army. These tiny countries cannot resist the concentrated might of German arms and take their orders for surrender over the German-controlled radio stations. Even Hitler's attempts to remake the map of Europe brings few changes to Berchtesgarten. At Hitler's hideaway, it seems that everything is always the same. The same girls in bathing suits seated on the same blankets, the same water sports, the same carefree air. But not entirely. The beauty of a butterfly's wings are indeed fascinating, as are many things bright and gay. But a butterfly's wings are quite different from those of transport planes. and the transport planes carry a deadly cargo. With blinding swiftness, the chain lightning of the Panzer strikes into Holland. Surrender is almost immediate, then into Belgium. The British are rolled up at Dunkirk. This time, Paris in the spring is a sad Paris. For the second time in a century, German troops march through the Arc de Triomphe. 
June 22nd, 1940, in the same railway car in the forest of Compiègne, which witnessed the German humiliation of 1918, the French are forced to sign the unhappy armistice. Among the Germans, there are congratulations all around, and De Vera, really letting himself go for once, almost dances a little jig. After a visit to the Paris Opera House, Hitler goes back to Berchtesgaard. He is spending more and more time in the old familiar haunts now, strolling the paths from the Berghof to the tea house that has been built for him. And Eva is less alone than she has been in earlier years. Under the impact of the tremendous events that rocked the world, Eva is undergoing a change. She senses the role she plays in her lover's drama, and this time, with Julius Stryker as guest, she acts with more dignity. If Adolf seems detached and moody at times, and even busier than usual with Joachim von Ribbentrop and Mussolini, it is because there are great things in the air. Everything is pointing to a blow at England, the bases in France and Norway, the air battle over Britain. But Hitler has other plans, known only to his intimate advisors, such as Joseph Goebbels and Heinrich Himmler. June 22nd, 1941. Three great Nazi army groups crash into Russia on a vast front from the Gulf of Finland in the north to the Black Sea on the south. The world is shocked. No one has expected this. Hitler and Stalin have been allies. They have split up Poland. They have signed a mutual assistance pact that drive carries deep into Russian territory. Advance is speeded because the Luftwaffe has absolute control of the air. In the Kremlin, in a slow, halting, colorless voice, Stalin calls upon his people to scorch the earth. But the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, has brought new allies and generals to the Supreme Command. Eisenhower and Bradley join Montgomery and Tether. American troops invade North Africa. Hitler's Russian invasion has stalled in a great swirling maelstrom of blood and fire whose vortex is Stalingrad. July 10th, 1943, the Allies invade Sicily. Hitler has Mussolini in for a conference. De Vera does not like the way things are going in the South. There is a saying, dictators ride to and fro on tigers, which they dare not dismount. Hitler gives the Italian dictator a severe dressing down. Benito listens, knowing his armies are collapsing. Eva is still kept in the background at the Berghof doing her slimming exercises alone as her fearer struggles with the titanic problems of the war. How can he keep his factories supplying the troops despite mass allied air raids? How to get more work out of slave laborers whose will to work must be created through terror and torture? and whose physical energy is being sapped by the lack of food due to the strain on the German economy. Full 
production can hardly be expected from starving men who must push and shove each other for the scraps left for them. Their desperate existence is hardly considered by the residents of De Pira's private retreat atop the mountain in Bavaria, Eva and her friends. During the summer of 1943, the Rhine maidens of the Berghof seem little concerned that their world is soon to crumble in the consuming flames of the Allied counterattack. Little Eva and her friends hardly have the capacity for such speculation. Her sister Gretel, heavier now, joins in the enjoyment in one of the crystal streams near the Berghof. The girls like shower baths. The Germans call them brass baths. This falls makes a natural one, cooling on this hot summer's day. But the showers of the German concentration camps are a different kind of shower. In place of the cooling mountain water, their jets carry deadly cyanide gas, showers of death for the unwanted, race extermination. Even the clothing will be salvaged. In its death throes, the Third Reich will overlook nothing usable. September the 8th, 1943, under cover of darkness, American and British troops strike across the Strait of Messina and invade Italy. General Mark Clark leads the invasion. Scratch one dictator, Mussolini. German paratroopers rescue him from the prison in which he has been held in protective custody Brought to Hitler, he thanks his savior profusely. He will live to be hung by his heels in the public square at Milan. Day and night, British and American bombers are taking off from bases in Britain and North Africa to bomb Germany. In German cities, the fire apparatus is kept constantly busy by the 1,000 plane raids. It is 1944, and the Allies have almost undisputed control of the air. Planes sweep through the skies and rain down destruction on Cologne, Hamburg, Berlin, the Ploiesti oil fields, railroad yards, and rocket launching pads. Never has war visited such havoc on the works of man. Hitler's visions of world conquest are beginning to fade. A battle at Monte Cassino in Italy. Soldiers of many nations are in the bitter fight for the monastery. And they take it and go on to Rome. This is truly an allied army. They understand each other, the universal sign language. The ones who can't understand are the bombed out civilians. They know little about the mad dictator who has caused their plight, especially the children. Along the shell-torn roads they trudge seeking shelter. Now for one of the last glimpses of the Berghof. It's the birthday of the son of one of Eva's friends. And war or no war, a birthday deserves a celebration. But even on a birthday, problems press heavily on a dictator's mind. The ring is closing, but there must be some move, some master stroke. And then the bombings. Day and night, day and night. This is the repayment with interest for Warsaw and Rotterdam and Coventry. Yes, the little fellow gets a birthday party. What will the next one be like? Will there be a next one? June 6, 1944. The French coast from Cherbourg to Le Havre. 
This is D-Day, 40 Allied Division Storm Ashore. At Berghof, two months later, Hitler and Nazi officials hold a meeting. A desperate bomb plot has miscarried. Several die in the blast, but Hitler escapes. The only after effect is a slight limp. This war, says Hitler, is one of those elemental conflicts which usher in a new millennium and which shake the world once in a thousand years. This is Schaub, who was then personal aide de camp. He says, Adolf Hitler's state of health got a lot worse because of the setbacks on the front, especially after the Battle of Stalingrad. He couldn't sleep. His nerves got worse, and he was forced to take to medicine. But I must kill all those rumors. His brain was perfectly in order, right up to his death. On the western front, General George Patton unleashes his tanks. Hitler has worked his revenge for what he considered the humiliation of Germany. He is paying its price. To a desperate Hitler, his blondie is of some comfort. Faithful when even the Fuhrer's life is threatened by his former friends. She is trained to kill on command. On the Russian front, things go from bad to worse. German troops are driven from Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, and Greece. The next Russian move will be into the German heartland. German troops bravely face the massive Russian attacks with the inevitable results when troops are outmanned and outgunned and hungry and cold. You'll never see a ghost step in the snow. Disaster follows disaster. The Allies storm across France and double their aerial assaults on Germany itself. German troops are surrendering now by the thousands. The white flags of surrender are fluttering everywhere. The GIs pull down the swastika and run up the stars and stripes. Soviet Hitler tells himself, if the Third Reich must fall, let it be to the Americans. But even this is not to be. There has been a deal at Yalta. The British and Americans are to draw up along the Elbe and let the Russians take Berlin. Hitler sees the handwriting on the wall. He must go to Berlin to turn the route into victory or fall in the attempt. And so he and Eva Braun go there and install themselves in the chancellery. There he screams for greater sacrifices. Berlin, a city in its death throes. All day and all night the guns thunder. Civilians decide to make a run for better cover. so you take chances.
April 20th, 1945, and the Russians are mopping up in the Berlin suburbs. Hitler has called in his staff the final meeting. Should they fly to the south, Hitler elects to stay until the end and goes to a bunker under the chancellery with Eva. Himmler and Goering desert. The crashing gunfire is the sound of approaching doom. On April 22nd, Hitler is in a state of nervous collapse. He refuses to leave the bunker. Julius Schaub remembers the scene. He says, I entered his bedroom in the bunker with him. On the table, there was a 7.5 pistol. He went up to it. I got a terrible shot. He cocked the gun. But no, it wasn't the last hour yet. He was only making sure it was loaded. A few days later, the event took place, which I thought was going to happen at that moment. Defenders of Berlin are routed out. Poison capsules are distributed to the inmates of the vault and the chancellery. On April 29th, Hitler marries Eva Braun. Adolf Hitler's personal pilot, Hans Bauer, tells about Hitler's final orders. He says, approximately one half to three quarters of an hour before Hitler's death on the 30th of April, he sent for me. When I reported, he took both my hands in his and said to me, Bauer, I want to say goodbye. For a moment I was speechless, and it took 20 minutes to say goodbye. And the other things he said, Bauer, I have two more orders for you. The first is, I make you personally responsible for burning the corpses of my wife and me. The second is, see to it that Bormann gets through to Dönitz. Dönitz will become my natural successor. I have given Bormann large numbers of orders and documents to take with him to Dönitz. All the time I was struck by Hitler's clear way of speaking. I couldn't believe that this was to be the finish. Nazi capital is taken. The last defenders are hauled from their holes. Amid the complete ruin, it is difficult to find out what happened to the fallen Nazi idol, but the full story is pieced together later. In the basement of the Chancellery, Adolf Hitler shoots and kills himself. Eva takes poison and dies. Their bodies are burned by Joseph Goebbels and Hitler bodyguard Martin Bormann and tossed into this ditch in the courtyard outside their death chamber. Here is Eric Kempka, Hitler's personal chauffeur for many years. He soaked the bodies in gasoline. He says, when I saw the chief for the last time, I definitely had the feeling that the end was near. But there was no change in him that you could see, not in his character nor anything else. He said goodbye and dismissed me. Next day, when the chief was dead, I went on to the bunker just as they were carrying out the corpse. Then came Martin Bormann with Eva Braun in his arms. I took her body away from him and carried her along behind Adolf Hitler. We placed these two bodies side by side in the garden. I had placed on me the exceptionally difficult moral duty of pouring petrol on them and setting fire to them. The corpses burned from half past one until half past seven in the evening. Joseph Goebbels shoots his six children and has an SS guard shoot his wife and himself. 
and the Russians hoist the red flag atop the Brandenburger Gate. American occupation troops arrive from the west, hoist the stars and stripes. Allied leaders, including American generals and Russian generals, take over. The Third Reich dies in a last convulsive catastrophe. The guns crackle sporadically. The Russians are shooting all suspicious persons. Berlin, May 4th, 1945. A city of smoldering ruins, which, like Phoenix, must rise from the ashes of itself. Adolf Hitler has left a mark on his country, which will be remembered for a thousand years. A thousand years, he said, his Third Reich would endure. Hitler's private mountain lair, Berchtesgarten, shares the fate of Berlin. The scene of his trysts with Eva Braun is a shambles. The actors have left the scene forever. The Nazi leaders are dead or in prison. And the female lead, Eva herself, is a rotting corpse charred beyond recognition. And what shall we say of the principal actor, the part-time common laborer whose dream of leading his people to world conquest ran the gamut of violence, torture, concentration camps, mass, death chambers, and ended in utter destruction. In death, as in life, Adolf Hitler remains the sinister symbol of tyranny, the ruthless tyrant whose mad ambition did not stop with the enslavement of his own people, but stopped only after it had unleashed upon the world the most brutal war in recorded history. Quiet has returned to the gay patio at the Berghof. A quiet which, despite the brutal lesson to be learned from the life of Hitler, has not yet returned to the world. The horrible specter of man's inhumanity to man still dwells among us. Thank you.